Okay, recording is going. Here we are. Okay, we're official now. I'm Pat Stevens in Penang, Malaysia, speaking here with a uh, good friend and longtime colleague, Gavin Dudney. And uh, did I get the pronunciation correct? It's Dudney, but don't worry because Dudeney. I've heard so many combinations <laughs> over the years. That... Yes. Well, I've, as many times as we've met, I should have internalized that. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, it is the 29th of July, 2020. And let's see, we're in Learning Together, episode 481. I've been going great guns with these. I've been doing something called Talon, Teaching and Learning in Isolation. And this is the 35th webinar in that, which we started obviously in about March, I think the end of March. So since March, April, May, June, and almost through July in four months, we've done 35 episodes, which is not bad. And um, so, yeah, that's where we are. So uh, Gavin uh, made a post on Facebook, something to the effect that, uh, oh, oh, I liked what you said. I guess I have to actually should probably put this up on screen <coughs> share as get, well. I'm going to look at it in a minute, so. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we're waiting for people to turn up. I presume you want to populate the room before you go into. We the... can wait for a little while. Um, it's just. Do you think we've picked a really bad time? Not necessarily. My <laughs> my events are typically from um, starting at noon, GMT. Uh, okay. Th through now, so some of them start at ten o'clock. I noticed that people in the United States uh, seem to have this time as well. This is. 10 o'clock in New York, 10 o'clock in the morning, and um, uh, maybe a little late for people over in Australia, but uh, let's see, in 1400, 18, 1400 UTC, that's uh, another four hours over to Japan, so it's probably, yeah, so two in the morning for them, I suppose. Right. But um, okay. anyway, for people in Europe, what you where you are right now, it's kind of an odd time. It's either nine or eleven. I can't remember how much how that goes. This is um yeah, so three o'clock in the afternoon for me. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yes, yeah, so of course, fourteen hundred of. Yeah. Which is between between dog walks, so ideal. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> a lot of people have trouble getting straight. I don't know how how did you go off on the time, uh, because uh, UK time being out of sync at this particular moment for half a year. Yeah. Uh, and people sort it's of... Always, it, it's always a bit problematic that, that this period because people get confused about the two times fairly easily. Um, and then people never know where you, whether GMT is actually UK time or not UK time. And They just think it is, don't they? <laughs> um, let me just do a screen share as long as it's just messing around here. Sure. And I'll, that, they'll take it over from you, but uh, you just put it right back. Let's see. Here's my share screen. I'll just show you. Uh, okay. I'm going to stop your screen share. You don't mind, I hope. No worries. Okay. And here, is, as long as we're recording, we'll just put this on the recording. This is uh, what I put up about your event. And you started off uh, on your, your Facebook post that I responded to, which instigated this. Oh, here's Lane, Lane Marshall. How are you, Lane? Hi, Lane. We were just talking about SOFLA. You can hardly talk about anything else these days. I'm sorry, I'm kind of eating breakfast and... <laughs> okay, I'm no here. worries, no worries. We're just getting started. So anyway, I was just showing uh, Gavin his post. He said, as I said here, I'd take an online stir fry class over a pointless <laughs> tool any day of the week. Typical Gavin there. But, you know, as long as you're doing online stir classes. I saw you posted that earlier. Okay, yeah. So this is uh, something that uh, Paul Seedhouse uh, published in one of my recent edited articles in the Tesla EJ. Sorry about the sirens in the background. I guess they're hauling away some more COVID victims. Uh, anyway, <laughs> middle of the night here. Uh, Anyway, yes, so Paul has developed something called uh, Lingua, Lingua Cuisine. And it's an app, it's free, and basically it gets people learning from each other how to cook. And it's got a lot of support uh, about you know, ingredients in many different languages. So um, 
you could have people in different with different native languages who could then figure out what the ingredients were in their different uh, cuisines, you know, in their in their different versions of them, their different recipes. So it, the thing that you know, this is obviously not a tool that's looking for a looking for a class. You know, this is a this is a an idea. He, he supports this. And if you read the article, he supports it. Uh, here, I'll show it to you. Here's his article. Hey, um, I really like the graphics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is where it comes from. But that, that's how it works. And you know, I show you, he's got three pictures here. Um, this shows a little of the support there is. Uh, so uh, he you know, they've trialed this on people in their own uh, situation and uh, tested it out on them. And so the idea is that you take something that people like to do and you throw in all the sounds and the uh, scrolling down this last one here, all the, the tastes and the sounds and the smells and the touches and all that uh, stuff that makes language real and, mm. uh, it, you know, add it to cuisine, learn from each other, share culture. And uh, our fourth person has just come into the room. So anyhow, I don't know. You have something you're going to talk to us about, but I thought, what's wrong with that or what's right with that? You know, so there's, I think it's a, a right approach. No, nothing wrong with that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, well, let me go ahead and, and grab the uh, screen back. if you like. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. And hi to Lorena. Hi, Lorena. So we're a small but select group at the moment. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I like it. So um, I want, I, I kind of plan to just talk for about 10 or 15 minutes and then leave the rest for discussion. Um, I know there aren't that many of us in here, so feel free to interrupt me at any point. But I wanted to um, put a little context around um, the bits that Vance posted um, in the wiki. So that's, that's me. That's my alter ego. Um, That's a good one. <laughs> it's a, a, a friend's daughter who does um, caricatures from photographs, and actually she got me down. Well, I, I think I've put on a bit more weight since then. But mm -hmm. anyway, so um, I wanted to put a bit of context around this. And first, I wanted to go back a little bit in history, um, back maybe I don't know eight years or more, um, and I think with the rise of uh, Facebook and Twitter. We were constantly bombarded by these kind of posts for about three or four years. You know, 28 uses of Twitter in the ELT classrooms, 35 uses for word clouds in the ELT classroom, and all those kind of things. And I have to confess, <clears throat> at the time, uh, I was quite excited about all those. We were going through a really big period of change then. Lots of new tools, lots of new things coming along. and. Um, I've always thought that we were, in, in English language teaching, we're really good at um, looking at tools that weren't made for us and making them work for us. And I kind of like that. So um, as the slide says, forgive me friends, for I too have sinned. I spent a lot of time in the past um, reading these articles, maybe even writing some. I had a blog for a long, long time. Um, and then one day I accidentally deleted it all and, it, and, and realized that I didn't care. So I stopped blogging. <laughs> um, but I used to indulge in all this. And I do remember at the time, Scott Thornbury, who's one of, um, certainly one of the UK's greatest uh, writers in the language field. He, he was very um, exercised by these kinds of articles and blog posts. And he said that we were concentrating too much on the tools and not enough on the pedagogy. Um, and this came back to me a little bit when COVID hit in March. Um, pretty much most countries, I think the UK is a great example, but we all did it. I think teachers were told on Friday afternoon, <clears throat> go home and teach all your classes online starting on Monday. Um, and there was a, a huge, huge, uh, panic at the time I think everyone was pretty um, stressed about it all and I remember there was a there were there were two kinds of Facebook posts that I noted over the 
the first week. The first kind was people just saying, I've had a class. I did a class and it was okay. Thank God for that. I survived my first online class ever and it wasn't a disaster. And then there was a, a section of our community, the technology community, who I thought were being a little bit kind of um, perhaps a bit overzealous um, about tools and things, uh, but also a little bit kind of critical about what was happening at the time. And that was when I wrote the, the Facebook post that, that Vance refers to. I've, I've just um, referenced it a little bit up here. I, it was about um, basically t uh, some of the EdTech community telling teachers that they couldn't just go and teach online, you know, that it was a big skill, that, that there were specialists in this field and that you can't just do it. And I remember thinking, well, actually, you can just do it because at the very basic level, all you need to do, and this is what I recommended, was um, buy some sticky um, whiteboard paper, which you can get in most countries, stick it on the wall of your bedroom or your office, and use Zoom to just carry on teaching the way you were teaching. Move around, write things on the board, talk to people. And that would actually be a really good start and actually maybe stop the panic. And usually my Facebook posts are read by about five people and two of those actually live with me. And this post was read, liked by 799 people, shared by 381. And so I thought it, it obviously struck a chord. Now, I, I don't think that is it because I think online teaching is different. Um, and that if you're going to do it long term, if you're going to do it well, then it does require some skills, some extra skills. And it also requires more than Zoom or more than a synchronous platform. It also requires um, an asynchronous platform as well. Um, and this struck a chord with lots of people, I think. Um, here's some typical comments. I'm afraid there are so many apps and extra online resources being flung here and there that it can be really overwhelming for the teacher. Keep it simple. And I thought that was really good advice. More, most teachers were given zero or little training, also true. Um, and the stress on money to suddenly be a tech whiz is unfair and unreasonable. Everyone's inundated with how to techify guides and videos as though the technology overrides pedagogy and content. It's just to support. Sit back, breathe, one step at a time. Hang in there, everybody. Couldn't have put it better myself. Um, and then I noticed in some of the comments, this is a comment that, I, that really struck me as not, not being helpful. And it says, my complaint from the beginning is that we've taken some of the best classroom teachers and asked them to replicate a classroom on Zoom. That's not the way it works. You cannot replicate a classroom online, and you shouldn't. You should do so much more. It could be so much better. And this, it was this kind of comment that I thought must be adding to the stress of teachers who'd just been told to go online. Um, and there was a big discussion on that Facebook post, and there's been big discussions elsewhere of, of what we should be doing and why we should be doing it. What I've been doing in the last three months is I've been sitting in on some classes, online classes, and I've also been interviewing teachers who were not online teachers before and not big technology fans. And I wanna show you some examples from a, a school. These are all taken from the same school. They're taken from a school called IH Torun, which is in Poland. It's an international house school. And I started noticing that what they were doing was really interesting. They weren't doing these fancy online classes with Kahoot and Quizlet and all these kind of things. What were they doing? They were cooking. This was a young teacher called Nicola, absolutely fabulous car. She took her laptop into her kitchen in her flat and she cooked a stir fry while she taught her students. So, you know, the usual things, boil, grate, stir fry, marinade, slice, all those kind of things. Brilliant, brilliant class. Absolutely fabulous idea, I thought. Um, and it involved nothing but Zoom, but, and most importantly, a really, really good teacher and a teacher who knew how to get the best out of a really difficult situation. And I'm concentrating on this school because it's just the one that I know really, really well from the examples I've seen. Here's another thing. 
a, a junior class where they were making mythical creatures out of um, modeling clay or plasticine. But the one thing that strikes me if you look at the people is just how engaged they are. Again, no tools, just Zoom. Another class, they invited a famous uh, whistleblower, Catherine Gunn, to attend their class and interviewed her. Um, it, she was the subject of a film called Official Secrets. Uh, her character was played by Kira Knightley in the film. So he managed to convince this woman to come into one of his Zoom sessions and uh, talk to his students. And then this is Nicola, the woman who did the stir fry, working with a lot of really young learners, uh, producing Easter, chocolate Easter nests. Um, and all the kids made them at home with the teacher um, giving instructions. And to me, that really exemplified what good online teaching is, I thought. I thought they were great examples. They weren't complex. They weren't asking people to take on a bigger challenge of, of bringing in other external tools, creating accounts, trying things out, failing, all those kind of things. And the thing about tools is that people like us, I think, are we technology fanatics, we get utterly obsessed with them, We're constantly obsessed. And I, I know this because I, I run training sessions every year, both online and usually face to face. And I do introduce teachers to some tools in those sessions. Um, but I also make a point of saying that I don't think they're that important. But I can guarantee you, if I introduce 20 tools over three weeks, that when my teachers get home, if I ask them to do a mind map of all the tools they've used and how often they've used them, it would look a bit like that. Yeah, you're not supposed to read those. It says other tool. Um, so the teachers, I, I, you give them a tool, they become obsessed with it. Kahoot's a great example. They use it in every lesson or Quizlet. And then there's some other stuff. But um, to go back to those examples, I thought their, their elegance and their impact was, was in their simplicity. That's what I really, really liked about them. So that's where we got to. And it's been called emergency online teaching. It's been called all sorts of other things. So where are we now? Well, I think we're at a really interesting point because here in the Northern Hemisphere, we're just going into the summer holiday period or we're in the summer holiday period um, and students won't be going back until uh, late August, early September. And I think there's still um, a vague aim that all students will be going back in September into at least into state education. I don't know about the private language schools. Um, my feeling is that they probably won't. And if you look at the private language school sector, my feeling is that there'll be a group of students who have studied online for the last three, four months who will want to carry on studying online. They won't want to go back to the old system. Because the one, one of the other things that's happened, I think, is that students who traditionally would have thought, I don't want to study online or online studying is awful, have actually found out it's all right and some of them will want to carry on doing it. And teachers who also thought that online teaching was rubbish have actually had some really positive experiences. And interviewing teachers for a little research project, a lot of the teachers that I've spoken to have been really pleasantly surprised at the level of engagement online, the attendance, the amount of work people have done and all those kind of things. So I think we might see a hybrid model, some people in classes, socially distanced, and some people at home. A nightmare for the teacher, that's for sure. Um, wh whichever way you look at that, I think. I've nearly finished, I just wanna say a couple of things. None of this is about the tools, I think. Um, there's a link to a blog post there, which, which Vance has already linked to. The future looks kind of shaky for education, I think. It looks shaky in terms of attendance, um, and it looks shaky in, in terms of what happens to teachers and, and the amount of work they have. And I don't think there's any denying that. Um, we're seeing now in Europe, they're talking of a second wave. I don't think we've actually got rid of the first one yet, but clearly it's coming back. It's going to continue to come back until we find uh, some kind of vaccine. 
Um, so we've got this period of uncertainty. And I think, I don't think teachers should be worrying about the tools. What I think they should be worrying about is online skills, teaching skills, not tools, skills. So I think, firstly, for every synchronous platform, there needs to be an asynchronous platform. It's not enough to just have Zoom because Zoom is a very ephemeral thing. Even with recordings, people come to sessions, they go home and that's it. What an asynchronous platform like Moodle or Edmodo or whatever will allow you to do is to provide some structure around those live sessions and allow people to do other things, to track their progress, to do some exercises, et cetera, et cetera. So what I think we need is we need, ooh, tra ooh training, not tools. Training for teachers about how to teach online, how, about how to combine synchronous and asynchronous platforms, about how to measure progress, about how to cope with assessment and all those kind of things. But I think the last thing people need at the moment is a mad collection of tools and three or 400 ways of using them. So that was basically, that's it. That was the premise of, of, the, of the Facebook post and of the blog post. Um, I, th I think, you know, we need to support teachers and, and the way to support teachers is to give them the confidence to do what they're gonna have to do and not to um, pummel them with tools, attractive of the, as they may be. That's it. <laughs> so well, anybody... you're, you're certainly pre preaching to the converted here <laughs> yes i know it's it's a bit of a, a shame coming to this kind of group to talk about this but there you go no but that's why i'm here because uh i am working to try to get the same point across in fact i've been uh this is i should probably turn on my camera if we're talking i guess yay uh, uh, <laughs> i don't I haven't seen okay. myself today. Oh, good Lord. Oh, well, sorry. Just friends. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I have a presentation called Online Pedagogy. It's not just tech tools. And um, when I go in there, I say, you know, if you're here to learn about tools, that's not what we're going to talk about. And, but, you know, there, you're so right about the fact that we, we get obsessed and not only we get obsessed. I mean, I got excited about Miro just a few weeks ago. Uh -huh. and I, I'm like, Miro, my new best friend. And I used it right away with, but, but that's us. And we have, we can control that. What is <laughs> harder to control is that teachers want tools and invariably in the chat while I'm presenting, everyone's talking about tools. Oh, did you try this? Have you seen that? Uh -huh. And they are obsessed with the tools because they, because tools, I think the reason they have this obsession is that tools are concrete. They're something that they can learn and use and say, okay, I can teach online because I use the hoop, you know, and it, it sort of solves their problem. Mm. They avoid looking at the deeper issues that you're talking about when you listed how to do the training just now. Yeah, maybe it means you don't have to think so much about the pedagogy if you've got a lot of tools. I, I run a, a, a master's module every summer face to face. This year it's been online. And um, there are various themes that run through the, the two weeks. But, uh, but one of the themes is mobile learning, which is a big favorite of mine. And every year at the end of the, the, the day, day and a half we spend on mobile learning, Everyone asks, are you not going to give us a list of apps? And I go, no, I'm not going to give you a list of apps. <laughs> because you don't need the apps. I mean, mobile phones are brilliant. They take photographs. They make videos. They make audio recordings. You can read things. You can listen to things. There's, a, there's, there's millions of things you could do on a mobile phone without an app. And, I, I, you know, this obsession with lists of apps and tools, I think, is, is extremely unhealthy amongst us. <laughs> and the people we, we spend time with, but it's distinctly unhelpful for all the new online teachers, I think, who are just surviving, surviving well, many of them. Um, that young woman I showed, Nicola, who did the stir fry and the chocolate nest and things, she's been doing some amazing stuff and it's been absolutely brilliant. And it's just good teaching.
Well, it's interesting because I was I'm coaching I'm coaching my faculty uh, at the college where I work, and some of them you mentioned what you were talking about was using uh, essentially synchronous only, and relying on that. Um, I had one faculty member like that, but I also had others who were not interested in any synchronous at all. They just wanted to do asynchronous. So I had both, and what I found was each, each individual faculty member, I had to work with them separately and discover what's their teaching style, what's their subject matter, what are their inclinations, and then I had to develop kind of instructional design. I had to develop what online teaching would look like for them, and it looked completely different for every single faculty member. It, and my, um, my dean had asked me originally, she said, why don't you do a workshop? This is, by the way, I'm just faculty. I am not a tech, I'm just a faculty member who has learned technology. But um, she said, why don't you do a workshop and just teach them all how to do it? And I explained to her that, you know, that's, they're cats. <laughs> they're cats. Don't you know that easy? Yeah, so I had to, so I've been meeting with them. In fact, I'm meeting with one later, but I, I have to meet with them individually and work with them individually. There's no one way, you know, how do you teach online? Well, how do you teach? Who are you? And then you construct it for them individually, which is very labor intensive. And that's an issue that I'm exploring is, is there any way to make this a little less labor intensive than what I'm doing? <laughs> Yeah, know. that's a, it's a, it's a, I'm, in my professional life, in, in the paid work, we're currently working with two different sets of, or groups of people, I think. The first group are schools that just want their teachers to be taught how to do good things in Zoom. So we, we're doing quite a lot of Zoom training, if you like, and uh, sample classes, that kind of stuff, so people can see it. And then there's, um there are, probably I think larger organizations who are trying to plan and think more strategically so they're looking beyond the panic or the survival to this could go on for a long time you know it could come back if it doesn't come back something else will come along and we're probably entering into a period of, of well where we may have to move constantly and smoothly between online and face to face, you know, it may with local lockdowns, which we now have in the UK, you may have to say, look, all, all the, all your classes are going online next week for, for the, for the following three weeks, and then we'll be back in class. And so I think organizations need to prepare to, for that kind of journey in and out of lockdown and, and what that's going to look like. So a, a, the bigger organizations are, maybe ones that didn't have but they're they're beginning to now want to adopt an asynchronous platform like Moodle or something to be able to plan and move their curriculum into a into a proper blended space where they can do that kind of in and out of lockdown thing and that's interesting because as you've just said everyone's different and every school is different and they all have totally different needs so you can't just plan this kind of work and deliver it to different people it's got to be you know it, it, it's proper kind of deep sort of consultancy work I think where you're spending time with people well every teacher is different all the students are different and totally yeah. so, but you're going to intersect you know so uh, uh, and and also if you're engaging you can bring, win people over to your side so I mean if it were me, I would spend a lot of time in Minecraft. I mean, I wouldn't spend all my time, but it would, I, would, I would go there every now and then. That's just something I like to do. And I find it useful for language learning. Um, but anyway, uh, what I have been doing in my classes, because I'm not allowed, I haven't been allowed to go into Minecraft where I was last working, motorcycles, <laughs> um, is I, I would set up, blended environments and so you're talking about the synchronous and the asynchronous uh i always have i've always been preparing something that where you know that bases my class and also makes you think as you said makes you think about your pedagogical strategy because if you actually set it out on a wiki or in a moodle or schoology or something like that it actually has to hang together mm -hmm. so uh 
that's that's um, you know that's that's quite important. And also in this in part of this talent thing, well, I, I got into this because in January and February I was doing uh, courses on blended learning for English language specialist uh, program, and so I was teaching. They wanted me to, to do sessions on blended learning and not just the same thing over and over again, but they had, I had to set up uh, four hours of this uh, and then approach it differently with the different people I would meet for one day. And, but then when we got into the online part of it, um, we started setting up what became the Talon webinars really. And Jeff LeBeau came to one, you know, Jeff LeBeau? Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, now he's a teacher in Korea who is also famous for his world bridges and Korea bridges, all the different uh, communities he set up doing webcasting. Uh, he was a, a pioneer in this kind of thing. And, and he's been, now he's in Korea and he's been using this with his students. One of the things he does is he has them teach cooking. So he gets them all in uh, sessions like this and uh, has them, uh, uh oh. <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> Where are we going? <laughs> I'm trying to stop my camera going. Hold, hold on, it's, it's, it's going too fast. <laughs> I'm trying to stop my camera going in and out of focus. I've got no idea why it's doing it, but it's really annoying. Well, it's annoying me, so it must be annoying you guys. Well, the point is that what Jeff is doing, what I've been doing in normal classes, doing blended learning, or what I call blended learning, or you can also call it, uh, what's the other term for it? Um, um, I don't call it that. Yeah? Hybrid, 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 thank you, hybrid learning. Um, doing that in classes that you meet face to face, you've already got your foot in the, in the skill set that you need uh, to take it online. And so Jeff has actually been setting up hybrid blended experiences for his whole college. And then when they suddenly decided on Friday that they had to start on Monday doing uh, online, it wasn't a big leap. You know, so I think in a way that's kind of the, the secret. You're you're less daunted if you've already been doing things online, meeting people face to face. You have to replace the face to face now with something that's engaging in Zoom or however you do it. Uh, other options as well. Um, you know, maybe we should ask Lorena what she thinks about all this. I find it extremely interesting. Uh, I've been following in-person sessions when I was in the UK. We moved temporarily to Ireland because we were in lockdown and uh, we just, we had a place in Southwest Ireland. We do own a, play, a, a small house 20 years ago, we started building this house and it's, uh, it's our safe place to be. And it feels so safe, so good. I can't explain we are remote but we have internet i think you can hear me well don't you yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. good internet yeah i mean we're really far from any civilization which is wonderful we have our own uh, well you know we have water we have solar panels <laughs> so if you right. like it's the place to be at the moment in london we live in central london um we have we have been, we have been home educating for three years our daughter so it's no change. In fact, our daughter is thriving in learning uh, since the lockdown, because there was a need. And when there is a need, children learn more. There is a point, you know, it's a why they're learning. So she's running her own Zoom sessions for children, and that's been really interesting, because they're learning how to host sessions. And they bring uh, topics, which is very similar with that school, Gavin, you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, is doing, they're doing cooking, they're doing a uh, lot of games, of course, Minecraft, they're experts, and but they host and they, the idea was of the project is to collaboratively uh, create a list of do's, you know, what to do to yeah. host really well. And is the, it's very similar what you've been doing, saying today, goodness, if you said, keep it simple, that was one of the tips when child said after hosting, another said, I mean, they are six to 12 years old, Another said, have a backup plan. We learned that quite quickly. <laughs> yeah. Another said, take notes so that you can time it properly. And the last one said, you need to time it, otherwise either it's too short or too long. Um, 
it's been an amazing. The last session is this Thursday. We voted the community where 25 families. It's something that I really want to keep learning over August, but we do need a break. <laughs> so um, we are just re reorganizing the learning. And this next Thursday is going to be a 10 minute slot. So every child can bring their own topic. They will be hosting for 10 weeks and we'll move on. I mean, for me, following these sessions, advances, coordinator organizing for years uh, it's been so good because i had you know i was every week actually listening to the, the recordings while i was moving home and <laughs> um so i mean for me this is the future i feel so comfortable uh what i see is some of the facilitators uh, that do the sessions i mean we are based in rada in the uh, royal academy of, uh, of uh, dramatic art in rada it's a home education group and it's not uh, curriculum based it's interest based so it's a new project I'm, I'm coordinating and and this blended side is really work for us beautifully so uh, lots of kids didn't like online and they love it now um, because I think we work with uh, Andrew Tidmarsh who is a film director and he's running the drama session so he worked on the camera first so he did a lot of exercise on how to follow the you know, the camera with a finger and lots of things. And after that, then he just let the children do whatever they like, basically, <laughs> and support the storytelling. And from that, we're moving to um, Graham Stanley. I have been following his um, recordings. I'm hoping that my nephew will start storytelling that kind of model soon. Right. But for me, it's been all of this. I mean, today your session, Gavin, I'm, 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 I participated in your courses and in moderation 10 years ago. Yeah. And, and I, for I, me, meeting you in person is like, I know wow. I recognize the name. <laughs> but at those times, we were in like chat boxes. It was so good. It's become too. Uh, it's not very inclusive because some families don't can't afford a computer, you know, that, for instance, the fancy background, the children really like, and some children can't do it because the computer is too yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's become too fancy, you know, the, and the amount of tools used, we very simple. I think you're completely, you know, I mean, you're an expert, of course, you know, but for me, it's reassuring that you're confirming all, all these you know that we have experience well, yes let's let's say hi to carla and hey, also carla. in the facebook uh chat we have jane shien and helen galani uh hi, maybe friend. some other people there um lots of interesting things there Lauren. thank you um i think um the one thing that we, we we didn't mention there of course is that many teachers who have been doing this fabulous emergency online teaching have also been homeschooling their own kids mm. and i think you know juggling all that during the day must have been a, a real proper challenge you know i mean i i all i have is a dog that needs a walk three times a day and um and i'm kind of in control of that so so in that respect it hasn't affected my life at all but i do think some people have been under extraordinary stress from a variety of different things um so it's not just stress from folks like us telling them about loads of wonderful tools, but also, uh, you know, just keeping the family together and all that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, those teachers who have survived this uh, with some kind of sense of humor intact have done very, very well, because I think it's been an extremely challenging period. I see that Mig but, Miguel Mendoza is with us as well. Oh, um, lovely Miguel. Hey, <laughs> hi Miguel. So, um, Carla, are you, are you, um, how is how is it going? Are you? I'm not really sure what you're doing exactly now that you've moved from Casa Thomas she's Jefferson. Doing, she's doing loads of amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are here trying to, you know, uh, do some well helping teachers to go through all this period. And uh, I read Gavin's uh, article blog post about uh, you know the talk today. I couldn't come earlier, but uh, I read it and was really interested because it's the same approach that we feel uh, here that it's working with teachers in Brazil. Uh, teachers, uh, they get lists of tools and stuff and um, it doesn't help much if they don't know what to do with those tools. So 
I think we are uh, doing similar jobs in different parts of the world. I think in the webhead spirit more than ever. Uh, you know, I think uh, what we've been talking about for, I don't know, more than a decade or 20 Way years more. ago. Way more. I think it, it is making sense for people that we've been trying to preach for so long. And it seems like the webhead spirit now is everywhere and people want to understand what we, we've been talking about for so long. So um, I think that the main thing with teachers now is not the, the what, the tools, but how to, yeah? So how can I yeah. survive and, and move from this emergency period? And, and I guess that we are getting there. Things are normalizing and, and accommodating in some way and teachers feel that now they need something else like uh, okay i've i've been through all that i've been here for four months five months in emergency mode trying to survive with my kids with you know my kids online my kids at home mm -hmm. what gavin was saying and now it's it's a matter of um really uh some of them are really into taking that step further like uh, what can i do now from now to feel safe and to move from this emergency period um in in terms of the, uh, professional development and that and i think that's where gavin is where i am and many webheads are i guess i think we we called it uh, from from surviving to thriving <laughs> you know it, 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 from from actually it's just perfect. just just being able to hold on to it for a while to actually getting up and going do you know what i can do this you know yes. i've got i've got the tools and the skills yeah and, I mean, and then like it's the great reset that the world economic forum talked about and i think that's uh the greatest chance for teachers who really to really consider this reset in terms of retooling and then what do i do from there yeah i think uh, it's an amazing yeah. time. It's hard, but it's it's really the world has stopped to, for us to learn that things are digital. There is no way out. So, it's I, I think it's stopped for us to learn all sorts of things. You know, it's kind of interesting watching the um, the dialogue around things like uh, conferences and flying to other countries for meetings and all those kind of things in the light of the climate crisis. And not being able to do it has made a lot of people realize that actually they don't have to do it, which has been interesting. Um, we've, we've, we've had, I think, well, certainly in, in, in my house, we've re-examined our relationship with shops and who we buy from. You know, we've, we've bought a lot more local food, local butchers and local fishmongers and things like that. So it's had an impact on a variety of things. There is a danger, of course, that we just slide back into doing what we've always done as soon as it's possible. But um, hopefully education is a bit more um, adventurous than that, maybe. I hope in London we won't do that because London is not a nice place, you know, with all the, all the contamination. I mean, the last, during the lockdown, London was a paradise. The air was clean, we could hear the birds singing through the window. And, and it's just not such, it's not a nice place. And everyone agrees with that. But now I could see um, people getting back to normal too quickly. And I was concerned about that. You know, I, yeah. so I hope we won't come back to the normality in London. You know, I don't know. Where are you based, Gavin? Are you, I'm, I'm just um, outside we, Swansea in Wales. Swansea. Oh my goodness, that's fantastic. So I live in a, uh, I actually live quite near the city, but I live in a tiny row of 10 cottages. Not all wow. of them, I only live in one of them, with um, fields, <laughs> fields behind and in front of us. So it kind of feels like the countryside, but it's only 15 minutes to the city. That's wonderful. Um, my family comes from Mumbles. Um, ah, from, the from posh Welsh, 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 my husband. <laughs> yes. It's a gorgeous place of the world. I love Wales. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, they, don't, fine, then. they don't allow us poor people into the mumble. <laughs> well, yeah, so you're speaking about going back to where we were. Uh, you mentioned in your article and also, I think, earlier that um, 
the, some of the practicalities of going back to, uh, you know, I've heard a lot, you know, language school uh, owners are quite concerned because, you know, you've got to get people into your school if you're going to survive. And you know, how do you, that, that's quite a lot to well, cope I, with. I, 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 my, my, history there is in private language in the private language school sector obviously not the state system mm -hmm. and um the private language school system has always had a fairly tough time at making money i mean you you need high occupancy in what are traditionally at least in europe small classrooms they're usually small classrooms with lots of people in them and you need something like 80 percent occupancy all the time you're open in order to make some profit and things like mm. that. So clearly that's gonna be a challenge. It's also, I mean, there's a difference between running a private language school in Barcelona where all your clients are local or running one in London where all your clients are coming from other countries, generally. Or not coming from other countries. Well, well, well yes, quite not. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's gonna be a challenge. And I, one of the things that people are talking about I, is this, again, people are using the term hybrid of, of basically assuming that there will be some people who will be in the physical classroom and they'll be socially distant. So there's probably going to be six people instead of 15. And then some people will be online somewhere and they'll be beamed into the classroom via screens and things like that. And I've got to say from a teaching point of view, that sounds like hell to me for all sorts of reasons technical issues. We know if you've ever been in a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting, where some people were online, you'll know how quickly the online people have forgotten about. Yeah, I, 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 just... had, I had to do that once. And um, I had two groups, the far away group and the yeah. in group. And what I found, I don't know if other people find the same thing, but what I found was that I could either relate to one group or the other. And so yeah. sometimes I would get very engaged with the online people. And then I forget that there are people right in front of me. I would completely yeah. forget that. And then yeah. the reverse would happen. I, I don't see a good pathway for that. Mom. No, and I actually think it's probably the only model that makes economic sense to private language schools because they're clientele are going to be reduced but they're going to be fragmented as well it's going to be a, i think a terrible time for lots of private language schools state education my guess is that most governments are just going to force kids to go back and that will be it and you know uh -huh. whatever what what will be will be oh, that's certainly the the approach in the uk everyone's going back in september basically you know and then we'll we'll see what happens and I, it, I just, it, it doesn't sound good. It, it doesn't sound like a sensible approach to me. I think, you know, we, I've seen brilliant online teaching. When Graham Stanley was down in Uruguay running, running the plan, so well, I went there and, well, we, we, we actually did some teacher training for that project, but I went and watched some of those classes from remote teacher booths, which were no bigger than my current desk. And it was magical. It was magical teaching. And within five minutes, you forgot you were sitting in a tiny booth in um, in Uruguay and that you weren't in the school. You just forgot because they, the teachers, the, the remote teachers and the face-to-face -face teachers were brilliant. And it was fabulous. You know, we know it works. But what we don't know is, is uh, I don't think this hybrid model is a brilliant one. And I think it's going to cause lots of problems. So I, I, I would expect the private language school sector, at least in the UK, to shrink by 50%, probably. Wow. Yeah, and we've already seen schools closing in the same way that we've already seen famous theatres closing, famous bars and restaurants and all these kind of things. You know, this is just, it's just a, a, a very odd period. And we're kind of lucky, I think. I, I certainly know that Nikki, my business partner and I, are as busy as ever because for once in our life we're doing something that everybody wants <laughs> I also said, you're good at first, what you do my what the thank you my first post on facebook was i've spent 25 years trying to teach teachers to teach online and then this upstart covid comes along and changes their minds in two weeks <laughs> <laughs>
I, that's the same thing that happened to me. I was <laughs> marginalized by my faculty. Oh, she's that one that teaches online. The weird one, yeah. Teaching is about relationships and warmth and all, and they don't understand. They think, you know, but now they want to talk to me. Well, it's, <laughs> this is our time now. I mean, I'm sorry it came because of a global pandemic, pandemic, but <laughs> someone's got to be there to sort it all out, haven't they? And and that's what we're for, I think, you know. I, I, I think we can help people, you know, and certainly the work that Nikki and I are doing with organisations is really interesting and fulfilling, you know, and, and, and um, just helping people get beyond that. So, so I have a question for you. Um, I did a, a, a survey of some of my uh, teachers, mm -hmm. and this was not the faculty members now, these are classroom teachers. And they, um, I said to them, what's your most pressing issue? What are you most worried about as you go to online teaching? And of course, everyone had you know, their own take on it, but the most common answer was to, to have engagement by the students, for them to really be engaged. And, and not just really thinking about their surroundings at home and things like that. These are kids. So the idea is how to keep them engaged. And I wondered um, if you, you know, how, we, how do you approach this issue of student engagement online? When you say kids, how old are we talking? Well, K-12, you know, okay. I mean, the, these I mean, are all teachers, language teachers, ESL teachers in the K-12 public okay. schools of the U.S. If you, you know. Right. I mean, some of those projects that, that I looked at briefly in, in, in the quick presentation I did, I think were brilliant examples of engagement. Um, Carla, th this was um, it's a, an international house school in Pol Poland, and they've been doing really amazing stuff remotely. They haven't been doing grammar exercises and things. They've been doing cooking a stir fry with your teacher and making models. And, and they've done, and it's that kind of stuff that works. I've also observed just because I was interested in what other people were doing, that there's there's obviously a load of remote teaching that that goes on in China and has been going on for quite some time, particularly with kids, because parents want their Chinese kids to get that kind of competitive advantage. And there's a massive industry in the U.S. providing online teachers to those Chinese schools, and I've I've observed some of them as well, and that's been kind of interesting because they do do exactly what you would do in a normal class. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of realia, there's a lot of jumping around, there's a lot of singing, there's a lot of finger puppets, there's a handheld whiteboard, and all the kind of things that you would imagine work. But for me, if the, those, the IH Tarana, Tarun activities were brilliant because they had a linguistic aim, but they also just, they did do things that you couldn't do face to face, because you couldn't cook a stir fry with your students in a language school but they didn't rely on any tools at all. They just relied on the brilliant planning of a good teacher. Look, I think if you need to keep people motivated, you've got to get them up and do stuff. But they've got to move around. They've got to create things. Um, they've got to go, if they're locked down in their house, there's got to be opportunities for them to wander around their house and find stuff that's going to be useful in their class. Take a photograph of their bedroom and talk about it you know these they're tiny little things but they're things that um i think do increase motive i bet carla's got some really good ideas go on i'm taking notes here but um <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> because i loved uh, what gavin said like uh, uh they didn't rely on tools but the great lessons uh lesson plans that a good teacher can do so i think this is what we need to tell teachers that uh, it's just uh, their gut feeling, what they are really doing in their classrooms. But in a way, I think that the main thing about engagement is that um, uh, what I feel the, the most successful classes in remote learning is when you, the teacher, uh, get this feeling of, you know, I have this lesson plan here. How can I integrate with what kids have in their homes? When they can do that, bring the context of remote learning, really thinking about remote and then the learning part, this is where magic happens. And that's what, I, what I've seen like from teachers that I know that are in, in different um, you know, uh, situations. 
And one thing that I think that is also important is to understand what didn't work that we can just, you know, dump it. We don't need to do it anymore. So for example, uh, I see, I, I can understand that the first stage is like substitution. So if I had a board, I really need the board uh -huh. and, and write on the board. But then when you realize that this is not engaging for the students and it was not in class, then I think magic starts to happen. And, and, and I see that from my kids. I had a, um, my youngest here, he was uh, in, sen in his senior year. Can you imagine? It's the best year ever. Yeah. And then uh, the school decided that they were going to reproduce what was not working in school. So they would have lectures from 7.30 in the morning till midday like lectures, just <laughs> reproducing what the kids had. They are 16-year-old kids. They are 15-year-old kids. They couldn't pay attention to that. They couldn't sit still for five hours. So I, in I an online either. environment, they wouldn't do it. They would wake up in the morning, turn on their, um, you know, the platform there, and then sign in. And then they would turn off their cameras and would, you know, be chatting on, on WhatsApp or going back <laughs> to sleep. That's what we did. So then uh, we talked to my kid and he decided to anticipate. He, we had to go to court to have an authorization so that he could enroll in a college. And that's where we got. We got to this point. Why? Because teachers were trying to reproduce what they knew. And, and I... I know, and, and I, I know the, the, the pain that they feel and, and, and the, the, the burden that they have, because most of administrators just said, go and do it. They didn't know, the, the, the leaders didn't know what to do. Absolutely. So that's the point. But then uh, when I see those teachers that they feel they start substituting and then they move on to the next step in the sense that realizing that now they have everything that they couldn't do before, that's when we get student engagement. Uh, uh, interestingly, I think this is, you, you know, Scott Thornbury's famous dogma teaching unplugged approach actually works in this situation perfectly. Um, it's about the people in the room, whether that room is physical or virtual, uh, and, and making use of people as resource uh, works brilliantly in, in, in a Zoom room like this. You know, I, and a, a bit of paper stuck on the wall behind you and just simple things can work magic, I think. We don't need to overcomplicate these things. And the more complex they get, the, the less likely they are to engage, I think, in a way. If you've got we people... We can all have our pets in the, in the classroom. We could never do that. <laughs> Kids' pets could never be in the classroom. Like I know, all are. those things that you can bring to class with you yes. now. I know. Um, so there's a, a framework um, that was presented in one some of the sessions I attended from David Rosen. He's a, an adult... Uh, adult educator in uh, this adult ed in the US. And what he said was that for when you're moving online, you wanna look for areas of equivalency where you can do the same thing that you did with minor tweaks. You also wanna look at the limitations, things that you're not gonna be able to do because there are things like that. And then you wanna look at the advantages, like Carla just said, there are advantages because there are things you can do that you couldn't do, uh, those three. And to those three things, which, which I think is very helpful if teachers can think in those terms. And then, yeah, yeah, this is David Rosen. And then I added another one to that, which is innovations, things that you never even thought of before that you can do, brand new things that you might be able to kind of change the whole idea of teaching by doing something innovative. I think what's interesting to go back to the stir fry class because I'm a bit obsessed with the stir fry class because I, it's one of those elegant ideas that I I just think it hits the spot um, immediately. Is well, it is something that you can't do normally, um, but but it it just reveals it, it's such a door into a, a, an empathetic learning experience. You know, watching someone cook whilst they're 
going through some verbs and you know chop and and it's such a it's such an experience that that, that that engenders such empathy that you can't help but learn something from it might not it might not be the verbs that she was hoping they learned but i can guarantee you everyone learned something from that class a little bit more about their teacher maybe well it's a little bit Whatever. like when you go to live in a country if you want to learn the language you don't just go to school uh, to to learn you're in the country so you're yeah. learning you're living the language. And so it's, it's a little bit like that, it reminds me of that. And I guess also because, because they were, people were in emergency that the pressure was off the curriculum as well. You know, that people didn't have to finish the syllabus or didn't have to finish the book. All they had to do was survive till the end of term without losing their students, I think. So they could do what they wanted to That's an extent. Cool. That's cool. That's cool. But, but well, maybe that was a, maybe that's innovation is curriculum. A lot totally. of times. But yeah. also, of mm -hmm. course, the exams, the exams were cancelled because the curriculum is there and the end is the exam, which is more, at the, I, I mean, in the UK is unfair, is the system, is the most socially unfair that uh, is known. But that disappeared, that went, which meant freedom. And, yeah. And that's not true it's, for the fall, it's great. right? And in fall, it's not true for the fall. Fall, they expect you to be doing the curriculum, right? Oh, they will. One, when school goes back, I, I, I would expect there to be a one or two week period in which there'll be a lot of stuff about um, wellness and that kind of thing to well get people back into the, into the system. And then it'll be straight back into the curriculum. Yeah, it'll be like this never happened. But I mean, the, the schools have been open. Right, they have been open with with um, children that needed uh, support, yeah, vulnerable so children, support children that needed. So schools there. also feed children. You know, the schools are very important socially uh, for. for they eating, are too. Actually, I mean, I, I think that's the bit that's missing. Obviously, is is kids playing with kids, chatting to kids. Yes, I believe this this term. I mean, this uh, there is, is at the moment open. The schools are open for social contact and for children seeing their friends more than anything else because they have had a very tough time, of course, um, because of that. Yes, but I don't know in September. I mean, many parents are very concerned about the, the children catching up. Um, we, we have an allotment in, in London, and we do a lot of community there. And I was talking to one of uh, the allotment years, and he was saying he, he had a three-year-old. He said he did one hour of English, and now one hour of maths. Because you never know when that little hat up when she comes back to nursery. I thought it makes you feel that you have to do that. Culture uh, where we live, we live in Clapham, which is quite a uh, lot of private schooling around. Yeah, yeah. And these uh, Mont Montessori, uh, Montessori nurseries are actually just uh, academic learning for really competitive. Um, which is, it really surprised me because, of course, in the home community, there's none of that. I mean, there's a mix of people, but competitiveness is not the aim. It's well-being and following your children's interests and engage with whatever your child wants to learn. So it's more about learning and teaching, what I really experience as a teacher myself. I see a lot of learning happening, but sometimes there's no teaching, but actually the, the children are still <laughs> learning. Um, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm going to have to leave you because sadly I've got a really long. Oh wow, um, that was a quick hour. A oh long A <laughs> module leaders meeting, which I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> that starts right now. It's been a pleasure seeing you. Thank you so much. We were a small thank you. Thank you. We, yeah, we it's been great to great to I see you again. Time. <laughs> Gavin it was Houdini. great to see you too, Speaking Carla. To tonight. But yes, thank uh, you ever so much. Our, Stay my safe, pleasure. Everyone. There's, there's a, a little chat going on in the Facebook. Uh, unfortunately, oh, yeah. I don't know how to integrate Facebook with what we're doing here. It's just too many fingers. Oh, I need more fingers. But uh, Vicky Sawmill joined us, and also Lillian uh, Simone, I think. Let's see. Oh, Liliana Simone. Liliana Simone, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, and a shout out to those people. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming and enjoying this. And, and Gavin, thanks for giving us your time and, and uh, no no I to be my pleasure. thank you so much i wish i could be more active but sadly the day job and the dog just 
fill up my time. But I yeah. thank you um, for keeping things going. Cleaning all and those tin houses, too, must be a real Inimitable pain. Saturn. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you, folks. Okay, I'll thank you, you very much. I'll just thank do a little care, outro. Thank you. Bye. But we Hi. say this is uh, Learning Together episode 481, and it's the 35th, 4th, 35th, I can't remember, Talon uh, episode. And nice to see Carla and Lorena here from you and Helene. So nice that you're here. And um, so Vance Stevens and Penang saying goodbye to everybody. Good night. Thanks a lot for coming. Good night. Nice see you, to see may, you. Maybe see you next Sunday. We're always uh, around on Sunday at noon UTC. Uh, different place. Just look at uh, uh, learningtogether.net. Sorry, learningtogether.pbworks.com. That's where you find the. Uh, the next thing is up. Okay. Bye. Let's see. I have to start Bye-bye. shutting this down. I think the first thing I'll shut down is Facebook. Goodbye, Facebook. Everyone in the Facebook chat. Let's see. How do I do that? Stop live stream. Okay. It's stopping right now. Carla, really good to see you. <laughs> okay. And now the recording. I'm stopping that. The record. Facebook, you have to stop it up at the top. The recording, you have to come down on the bottom and do it. So it's uh, stop recording. Okay. Bye, everybody.